Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church, where we strive to be followers of Jesus, loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and serving the world in mission. My name is Annalise, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad that you all are with us this morning. If you are new to us and you're here in the room, you'll find a green card in the pew back in front of you. If you would fill that out and leave it in the offering plate, that will help us get to know you better. And if you are here with us online, first of all, good morning, and we're glad you're here. And if you are new to us, you'll find a digital sign-in card in the comment section there on Facebook. You can also share and like and comment and put your prayer requests right there in the, in the comment section if you would like, and uh, we would love to get to know you better, and we're glad you're here. And if you all would like to talk to a pastor or if you have a prayer request, you can see our screens for ways to get in contact with us. All right, y'all, we are ready for our next song, which is Come As You Are.
please be seated as we invite Jan forward for our morning scripture. Good morning. We're going to read from Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning, friends. How are you all? You doing good? Good. All right. I'm going to need you all to do me a favor. Today, I have a thing that you're going to need to see up here on this table. So if you are a shorter kiddo, come and stand closer to the table. And if you're a little taller and can see over people's heads, stand a little farther back. But everybody come on up to the table, okay? Very good. Perfect. Come on over so everybody can see. So I have with me today a plate. And this is milk. And we are going to pour this milk on this plate. And the milk represents everybody in the whole world. Okay? The whole world. Got it? Okay. Now, I also have in this bag a few other things. One of them is some food coloring. And we are going to put a few drops of food coloring in this milk. And this food coloring is the love of God, okay? So I've got some green, and I've got some blue, and I have some yellow. Very good. I know, but it's actually yellow. It kind of looks orange to me, but yes. Okay, so... I also have in this bag a couple of other things. I have a Q-tip, which I'm going to use to spread the color out a little bit. But watch what happens when we do this. Now, this Q-tip, see it, represents you and me. And in here, this is dish soap, OK? Dish, so, dish, dish soap, dish soap. That's what I'm trying to say. That is hard to say. Dish soap. There we go. Now, I'm going to put this in here, and I want you to watch what happens. Ooh. Also, but look, look how the colors are moving. Do you see it? Watch the colors move. Isn't that cool? Now, this is what happens when we share about God's love with the world. The world goes from being this blank space to being filled with color and wonderful things, right? Because we have shared God's love with other people. That's what we get to talk about today. So I hope as you all go through this week and the next couple of weeks that you will think about how much God loves you and you will share that love with other people so that we can make the world look like this. Cool? All right, let's pray, and then you all can go to Children's Church with Miss Jeanette and Miss Kate and Miss Patty, okay? All right, let's pray first, though. Holy God, we are so thankful for your love and for our ability to share it with the world and to make it more beautiful. We love you. Amen. All right, head on over there or back to your parents. Thank you, friends. Pastor Kirk, would you lead our offertory? So at this time, we're going to show our love for God through our giving, and we always like to share the many ways that your giving allows us as a church 
to be the body of Christ in our greater community. And one of them is Valley Assistance Network. If you're somebody in need in Winchester, Frederick County, you can come to, the, to their office there on the campus of Our Health on North Cameron Street. And these folks' whole job is to put people in touch with resources that already exist in our community. They, they receive each person, you know, as they are, as their own client, and help them find the resources they need. It's one of the things that you help make possible through your giving each Sunday morning. So will the ushers please come forward. Thank you. 
We thank our band. Good morning. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street Church. And today we continue our worship series entitled, Don't Just Go to Church. We talked about not just going to church, but serving. Not just going to church, but being church. Not just going to church, but caring for others. Not just going to church, but belonging. Putting down roots. Becoming a part of an intimate community. And today we're going to focus on not just going to church, but also sharing our faith. Let us join our hearts in prayer. God, we thank you for the promise that one day we will rise, but now we kneel before you in our minds and in our hearts that you might say something to us on our journey, right here, right now, that will lift us up to become more loving people. In Christ's name, amen. My father, who was a pastor, would occasionally play golf. Actually, he regularly played golf at one point in his life with a judge who was an atheist. I remember one of the other people in his regular foursome was a member of the church that he served, but this atheist judge always piqued his interest. I don't remember so many stories about how my dad did playing golf that day as much as I remember him coming home and talking about these holy, sacred conversations where two people respected one another with different viewpoints. I mean, this man was highly intelligent, studied Greek philosophy, studied Hindu writings, Muslim writings, you know, and there was just this sharing back and forth, and they were already fast friends, and that allowed them that space to talk about matters of religion, whether they agreed with one another or not. If there is to be any hope of a future for Christianity in America, it will mean that Christians in America will have reclaimed their ministry of sharing faith. If we do not, there will be no future for Christianity in America. Think about that. One of the things to which Jesus calls each one of his followers is to share our faith. His last words, the risen Jesus before he was ascended into heaven, if you look at the way Matthew tells it in Matthew 28, his last words is to go make disciples of all nations. Our mission, as Braddock Street or any other Christian congregation, our mission is to make disciples, period. Is that where you are with your understanding? Unfortunately, many Christians just go to church, attend a religious service, and think that their religious obligation has now been fulfilled. We can say to each other as you shake hands with the preacher, have a nice week, right? And not really be bothered with what we're supposed to do with this great good news. Some folks in church believe that as long as there's a good amount of the right kind of or like-minded people, right? We've got enough folks here. Everything's okay. All is right with the world. Religion, after all, is just a personal matter. If they don't believe in God, that's on them. It's not my responsibility to care for what somebody else is going through in their life or what they believe. And sadly, what's going on today, such folk who believe it's not my job, that, that Such folk are not the first. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, I'm going to share a little bit of the context of what we heard today. Chapter 5 begins with, those of you who've read your Bible, the great catch of fish. Jesus saying to Peter, I know you haven't caught anything. Throw your nets on the other side. Great catch of fish. Peter realizes who Jesus is. Says, I'm not worthy to follow you. And Jesus says, Peter, get up, along with James and John later, and I will make you fish for people. That's your job, fishing for people. The next story is Jesus heals a leper, folks who were untouchable, right? Many crowds begin to follow him. He next heals a paralyzed man, and instead of just saying, get up and walk, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. Scribes and Pharisees, oh, what authority do you have to forgive sins? And Jesus says, just so you know I have that authority, I will say to this man, get up and walk. 
and he gets up and walks. Then we come to this morning's story where Jesus here in chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up, left everything, and followed him. For those of you who are new to Christian faith, tax collectors are not like modern-day internal revenue service agents. As much as we may fear them, these these folks are even more than any tax agent. These folks are the scum of the earth, at least in the scribes and Pharisees' minds. Tax collectors collected money for whom? For the empire, Rome. The very people who had soldiers on their streets doing Lord knows what to the people of Israel. Interesting thing, Matthew is called Matthew in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel. Luke refers to him as Levi. It's actually the same name in two different languages, Matthew being the Greek, Levi being the Hebrew. Luke is emphasizing he's a Hebrew, or at least he was raised as a Hebrew. He's one of us, and now he's taking in money for the empire, the very empire that oppresses us. He is a traitor, scum of the earth. And that's why it's problematic for Jesus to call somebody like Levi to be a follower. Next in verse 30, it says this, The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus is just beginning his movement. The beginning of chapter 5, he's calling the fishermen, you know, come on, follow me and I'll make you fish for people. Now he's calling a tax collector. He's starting a movement which will develop into this thing that you and I today enjoy called church. And it kind of begs us to ask the question of ourselves, do we really want tax collectors in church? Right? We're more comfortable with people who look like us, talk like us, similar, you know, social status or whatever you want to call it. We feel more comfortable. But Jesus never called us to be comfortable, did he? The first church that I served was in a very rural area. And I remember one Sunday, it it was a new couple. First of all, this community didn't get new people, right? Everybody was born and raised in the community. And a new couple had moved into the community. They were middle-aged, you know, looked pretty much like everybody else in the congregation, same socioeconomic status, same education, you know. And after church, one of the patriarchs, one of the male leaders of the church, caught me in the parking lot. He said, you know, I like those people. I think they'll make good members. Now, I know where he was coming from, right? I like them. They seem to be relational. I like what they probably will bring to our congregation. They have a lot to offer. It seems like they're already committed to Jesus Christ. But inside, I'm thinking, I know what you're saying, and yet, that's not what we're here for. To make good members or just to be in a group of folks who are like-minded. This is not, you know, we're not here to preserve the institution of the church. We're here to follow Jesus. And sometimes that's controversial, like we heard in this morning's message, right? We're not here to form a club like Ruritan or Rotary or Lions, all great organizations which serve our community, but this is different. We're here to be changed by the love of Jesus Christ and rejoice when other folks are on us or with us on the same journey being changed. And I love what Levi does next. Because you see, he's just so excited that Jesus Christ loves him as he is, even though everybody else treats him like the scum of the earth. He's so excited about it. What does he do next? Look here in verse 29. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. If it's up to Levi, he's going to fill the church with tax collectors. And that's why the scribes and Pharisees go, wait a minute. Jesus, why are you hanging out with these people? They're not like us. They're the scum of the earth. But in that moment, you see Levi's excitement. He is so filled with the joy that Jesus Christ, God loves him as he is. Notice Jesus Jesus does not approach him and say, you tax collector. How do you think 
Levi might respond. Is he going to follow if Jesus starts with a statement like that? No. No one else in the world is going to follow Jesus if we start with that same kind of attitude. You are such a sinner. That's not inviting. That's not genuinely caring for people where they are at the moment that you meet them. Sharing faith begins there with the relationship. Notice where so many of us have settled, those of us who've been long in the faith, right? We want our church to be the very best it can. If we don't like this church, maybe we'll go to another one and we'll look for the perfect church. A former district superintendent of mine, those of you that weren't raised Methodist, that's like the preacher's boss in the local area. He used to write a little devotional every month for a little district newsletter that pretty much only the preachers and a few lay leaders would read. Most of them I've read many times and, and just kind of cast them aside. Nice, nice thought for the day. This one is stuck in my mind ever since. He said, writing in third person as somebody who's looking for a new church, he said, I found the perfect church. The facilities were gorgeous. The music was wonderful. The preaching was excellent. There were no adulterers, no alcoholics, nobody with tattoos or body piercings, no addicts, no people who supported the other political party. I admit, I threw that one in, right? It's kind of where we are today. No needy people. Everyone seemed healthy. No divorced people. No, nobody with dysfunctional families and all their children were above average. Yeah, I threw that one in too. For those of you that listen to NPR. But what grabbed me was the ending. He said, I found the perfect church except there was no place for me. Because the truth about us is we've all got our stuff. Right? We've all got probably something on that list. If not that, it's something else. We've all got those places where we are imperfect, people that need fixing, and that's why Jesus comes. Because of whatever it is, our dysfunction, our addictions, whatever it is, that's why Jesus comes. And what are those moments in your life where God came claimed you, loved you as God's own, loved you just as you are. And in the minute of that joy, you felt a joy that you just couldn't explain to anybody else. Friends, that's what the world is hungering to hear. Be they atheists on a golf course or somebody talking over the backyard fence or just trying to grind out another work day by your side, that's what the world is longing to hear. That's the great good news of Jesus Christ as it has impacted your life. That's your story. Truth is, evangelism is, please don't ever do what so many of us have been turned off by, right? So many of us have heard, seen or heard evangelism done in the absolutely wrong way that we think, I want nothing to do with it. I approached an, an associate pastor of mine a number of years ago. And I said, do you think you could help lead the church's ministry of evangelism? And she said, oh, no, I can't do that. You had to understand who she is. She's, at first glance, very introverted. But she's also very thoughtful and very loving. And when you get to meet her, you know, her kindness is just kind of contagious. I'm like, you're the perfect person to do it. Because evangelism is all about relationships. You just get to know people. You just care for people. Not that you're trying to win them for Christ or try to convince them of anything. You just care for them and love them for who they are right here, right now, right in front of your face. That's what nobody will object to. That you love them. Right? Know your own story. And be willing to hang out with people maybe that need Jesus. One of the guys whose books I used to read, I'm sure he's gone to glory now, was Reverend Bill Eason. Had some great books. One of, them, one of my favorite titles was Sacred Cows Make Great Burgers. Um, but listening to him tell the story of his church, he took one of these very small, ready-to-close United Methodist churches in South Texas and grew it into this, you know, 5,000 people a Sunday kind of thing. And he started by going to the Red Fox Tavern every Friday night, the local bar. 
That's what the preacher did every Friday night. He went to the bar. Not to drink, but to meet people. To build relationships. And before you know it, people started having holy conversations with him at the bar. One was the drummer in one of the bands that played there on a fairly regular basis because his life was a mess and he really wanted to talk to somebody. Oh, there's a preacher in a bar after midnight on Saturday and my time is over playing for the band? Wow. And he would talk. Before you know it, he was playing in the praise band on Sunday morning. He was a little groggy because he hadn't changed his lifestyle yet, right? Bill Eason said, we had the most interesting congregation, you know, church leadership that was still in recovery. Um, but you love that. It's, it's all about building relationships with people. Now, for most of us, it's just deepen the relationships that you already have. Your classmates at school, your coworkers, your neighbors, yes, even your family, right? Just love them for where they are. Pray for them. God will begin to open up avenues by the power of the Holy Spirit before you're even aware. But bottom line, care for folks. Also know your own story. There will be a moment where you will be able to share with them things that you'd rather the folks here in church on Sunday morning not know about you. But trust me, we've all got it, right? It'll be in that vulnerable space with one another where you get to say, you know, I don't know how to fix what's going on with you, but this is what I believe. This is where God has helped me. One time I was here, now I am here, and I can't thank God enough for bringing me through that. Be patient. You're dealing with eternity here, so it doesn't happen, have to happen with this person next Tuesday. Please don't ask him to say the sinner's prayer. Please don't hand them a tract. Please do not get a bullhorn or, or hang a sign and tell them what a sinner they are. No, build the relationship. Just love people for right where they are and wait for that sacred moment that will open in time. They'll open it for you. It'll be something like, just caught my, ch my teenager with marijuana or my, my partner and I are going through a real rough spot right now. You know, it's going to be something like that where they don't have the answers. And you probably don't have the answer either. Don't pretend that you do. But join them on the journey. Love them for where they are. Listen, listen, and listen. And they will love the fact that you love them. We've all got our own stories. Where is that moment or moments in your life where God changed you? Maybe where you needed to be healed physically, maybe emotionally. Maybe there was some dysfunction in your family. Oh, my goodness. Nobody here has that, do we? Right? That's your story. That's what the world can't wait to hear, that there is a God, and there's a God that makes a difference in your life. That's what people want to hear. That's why we're here today, and that's where we're being sent from this place, to share the great love that Jesus Christ has shared with you that has changed your life in positive ways. Don't just go to church. Share your faith. It's what the world needs. Let us pray. Holy God, you have loved each one of us in this room right where we are. Help us to reappreciate that, oh God. Help us to claim that story of your love making a difference in our lives. Let us rise from this room, this sacred space, ready to share the greatest treasure that we have, the incredible love of Jesus Christ. These prayers we offer in the name of Christ, who has also taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able, and let us sing together, God's Not Dead.
Let love explode and bring the dead to life. A love so bold to bring a real shot somehow. As we go this morning, uh, just something for you to know. Our youth are having a yard sale in the covered parking area, that, a part of the building that faces Braddock Street. That'll be this Saturday morning. If you've got things you would like to uh, lighten your load around the house, you can drop them off this week. Uh, they'll gather them in the chapel. Jed Markwood, our youth minister, is back here in the blue shirt. He'd love to talk to you if you've got questions about that. But, um, but let us go this morning not having just gone to church but as people ready to share this great good news of God's love in our lives with the people that we care about. That's what will change the world. Go with the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. My God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's living on the Street.